بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my respected brothers and my sisters in Islam welcome to our uh, series on the tafsir of Juz Tabarak we are now on the fifth surah inshallah out of 11 surahs in Juz Tabarak uh, and today alhamdulillah we have the story of the greatest da'i uh, that lived uh, in the time uh, of uh, a few generations after Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, which is Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. The da'i that lived for more than a thousand years, of which 950 years he spent uh, calling to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, the story of one of the final, one of the five uh, ulul azm, one of the five top messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us his story in Surah Ankabut uh, and also his story in a special surah called Surah Nuh uh, which is Surah number 71 in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us uh, that in this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the way shirk started in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the, in the, uh, banu, uh, in the Bani Adam the way shirk started uh, was not by some people just waking up one day and deciding to worship idols. It was a gradual progression by which shirk came about in the ummah uh, of uh, Bani Adam. And the way it started was through righteous people, that when people started to glorify uh, and raise up these righteous people, uh, and when these righteous people died, people wanted to remember them. And because of that, they built statues, they built pictures, they drew uh, effigies of these people and then based upon this uh, they started to feel very sad and lonely after these people passed away and then of course the shaitan came to these people and then to their children and their progeny and told them that your parents used to worship these people so worship them so that is al-wad and su'a and ya'uth and ya'uq and nasr these were the five idols of the time of Nuh alayhi salam that later on became to be worshipped by the Jazirat al-Arab as well. As an authentic narration in Al-Bukhari narrates that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Wad su'a ya'uq ya'uth and nasr were idols of the time of Nuh, but then they began to be uh, worshipped also in the Jazirat al-Arab. So he mentioned that ya'uq, for example, was one of the idols of this tribe called Himar. And uh, Wad, for example, was worshipped in, in Ja'dan, in a place called Ja'dan, in, in, in the Jazirat al-Arab. So he mentioned many places that actually these idols began to be worshipped. After the time of Nuh, these idols uh, were, uh, were uh, saved uh, and of course they began to be worshipped subsequently. Also the tafsir uh, of, of, the, of the Quran mentions that these idols that began to be worshipped in the time of Nuh, salam were all righteous people and their names were actually not Wad. Their names were Abdul Wadud. Yeah? But then from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they took Ushtiqa, yani they, they took the names of the idols from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why if you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes talks about وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوا بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ and for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most beautiful names <clears throat> so call upon him through that and leave aside those people who do ilhad what is ilhad ilhad means to go deviate to deviate away from the truth and deviate away from the right path from that which is obligatory regarding the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the ways that the disbelievers deviate, deviated from the names of Allah is that they derive the names of idols from the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, an Nasir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes, becomes Nasr. Uh, so that is one of the names of the, of the idols, right? Uh, and this is how, of course, unfortunately, uh, 
uh, this is uh, how unfortunately the names of the idols were derived from actually the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never sent any uh, any uh, 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 haq for any justice for this is a story of Nuh alayhi salatu salam that was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the Meccan period in the Meccan period the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went through tremendous trials and tribulations and he did not uh, go through these trials and tribulations uh, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to remind him at every step of the way how to be an exemplary da'i. So at every step of the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him and helped him through the most difficult times of being a da'i. In fact this surah, surah Nuh was revealed at the time when the Prophet ﷺ was in great distress. Some of the scholars said that this story of Nuh alayhi salatu salam was revealed on, in those three years when the Prophet ﷺ was banished from Makkah. As you know, after the death of Abu Talib, uh, Abdul, uh, uh, of Abu Talib, his, his uncle, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was banished out of Mecca. They were living just outside the valley of Mecca, outside the city of Mecca in a valley they were staying. And they were in tremendous difficulty at that time. It was at that time that this story of Nuh ﷺ was revealed in order to give the Prophet ﷺ the glad tidings uh, that if he is patient, Allah's victory will come. Uh, and if you feel that you're going through difficulty, here is a story of someone who had more difficulty than what you had, which is for 950 years, this poor man was being mocked at, jeered at, uh, and cursed at. In fact, in one of the narrations of Ibn Abbas, عنه, it is mentioned that when Nuh alayhi salam used to call his people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people used to pass by and uh, they used to say, don't listen to him, he's a, he's a joker, he's a, he's a, a soothsayer, he's a magician. And then the people would grow old and they would have children. And they would have children, the children would have children. And the grandfather and the son and the grandson would all come together, all three of them. And they would all say, don't listen to this man. You know, all three generations of people would come past this Nuh as he was calling them patiently, believe in Allah. You know, have repentance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, salam. Amazing. So, Ikhwati, this is a story of the most persistent da'i that there ever was. Nuh alayhi salatu salam. Never did he make dua against his people except after Allah told him and revealed to him that those who have believed have already believed. No one else will ever believe after you. So, of course, at that point, the command came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anisna'il fulka bi a'yunina and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told him to create the fulk. What is the fulk? Fulk is the, uh, the, the plank of wood that he was ordered to get together. The scholars of tafsir did not mention just like the Judeo-Christian view of the plank was that the Judeo-Christian view of the plank was that it was actually a boat. It was made into a boat that's, that looked like a boat and in it Nuh alayhi salatu salam and all the uh, all the believers and also all the animals and uh, wild creatures and everything went in there, one or two of each. This is the Judeo-Christian view, not the Islamic view. The Islamic view was not necessarily that the whole earth was, uh, was uh, 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 drowned. That is not the Islamic view. The Islamic view was that where Nuh alayhi salatu salam was, which is around the Black Sea, around the Black Sea, around Mesopotamia. This is where, uh, where Nuh alayhi salatu salam was and that is the place that was actually drowned uh, and that had a huge, uh, huge uh, amount of uh, flooding until the scholars of Tafsir mentioned uh, that the water had reached the level of about 15 meters above the highest peak. Uh, had reached a level of about 15 meters above the highest peak in that region. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best whether it was actually a, a proper ship or not, whether it was a couple of planks of wood that was put together all tied up with ropes for which then Nuh alayhi uh, salam ordered his people to be on. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what the reality is. But what we do know is that the whole region was flooded and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed everyone, including one of the sons of Nuh alayhi salam, including his wife as well. And the wife of Nuh and his son were also disbelievers. They did not believe in Nuh So Ikhwati, this is the story of Nuh. Let's take the story inshallah. Uh, and bi'ithnillah, as we take it, it will become clear to you how, uh, how many lessons this story has for every single brother and sister 
who should be an exemplary da'i in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Couple of important points before we get started. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that very quickly on the reason and, and the da'wah of Nuh alayhi salam was based upon warning people, not giving glad tidings. First thing was about warning. So initially, very soon onwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about, verily we sent Nuh in order to warn his people to believe in Allah before the punishment of Allah comes. So therefore, the, es the essence of being a da'i is first to warn. The essence of being a da'i is to warn. Today, we follow a different approach. Today, we feel, oh, we can't do something that will cause them to go away. We use this word called hikmah. And we say, no, hikmah, hikmah, brother, hikmah. As if we understand what hikmah is and the prophets didn't understand what hikmah is. What is hikmah? The scholars of the seer mentioned hikmah is the sunnah. Hikmah is the sunnah. Okay? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to وَذْكُرْنَا مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And remind, O wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of what is recited in your homes from the signs of Allah and the hikmah. What was intended by hikmah was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So hikmah is the sunnah. So therefore, when we say hikmah, and we say we must have hikmah in a da'wah, what it really means is we must follow the sunnah of the prophets in da'wah, not what we conjure up to mean hikmah today. Today, people only command the good, they don't forbid the evil. And this is the mistake. Rather, the sunnah of the companions, the sunnah of the prophets, the sunnah of Nuh, والسلام, was to forbid the evil even before commanding the good. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لُعِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِن بَنِي إِسْرَعِيلَ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُودَ وَعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمْ ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَعْتَدُونَ كَانُوا لَا يَتَنَاهَوْنَ عَنْ مُنْكَرٍ فَعَلُوهُ لَبِئْسَ مَا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ Verily, those who are the children of Israel were cursed upon the tongue of of who? Da'ud and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. The two prophets cursed the children of Israel. Why did they curse them? Because they used to transgress the limits. What was their transgression of the limits? They never used to forbid the wrong that they used to do. This was a transgression of the limits. So, ikhwati, commanding the, commanding the good, forbidding the evil, starts with sometimes commanding, forbidding of the evil first before commanding the good. And that is because the scholars of Islam have complete consensus that darul mafsada muqaddam ala jalb al maslaha that to remove the harm is given precedence over attainment of the good. That means if there is one thing you're going to do as a da'i, first prevent the harm. That is more important than trying to achieve good. Trying to stop people from taking drugs, trying to stop the youth from going and sleeping around with their girlfriends is sometimes even more important than making them memorize the whole Quran. Then even more important than putting them in Islamic schools. Does that make sense? Preventing the harm from society is first and foremost more important than sometimes attainment of the good. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Every single thing I've ordered you and forbidden you from, stay away from it. And everything I have ordered you to do, then do as much as you can. So therefore, prohibitions are in totality. Obligations are by, by capacity and ability. But prohibitions is totality. And that is why, ikhwati, it is more important sometimes to prohibit people from the, from the bad. Tell people, akhi, don't do that. That is something Allah has prohibited. That is sometimes more important than sometimes telling the good. طيب. This is number one. Number two, Nuh alayhi salam, you will find that he will complain only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't complain to his neighbors, he doesn't complain to his bosom buddies, not complaining to uh, his wife. You will find him complaining only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again and again, he will raise up his hands, Oh Allah, inni da'atu qawmi layla wa nahara. So you will find him complaining only to Allah. This is a great lesson for us. How do we complain? Who do we complain to? Inni ashku bathi wa huzni ilallah wa a'lamu min allahi ma la ta'lamun. As Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam told his, his children, verily a complaint of my, of, my, of, of my difficulty and my sorrow only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why ikhwati complain only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
In the middle part of the surah, Nuh alayhi wasalam, will tell people the benefits of believing in Allah and repenting to Him. And it is important to realize those benefits. When we come to it, you'll realize the power of repentance, inshaAllah. Then in the middle part of the surah, Nuh alayhi wasalam, tells them why they should believe in Allah. What is the non-Muslim reason for believing in God? The non-Muslim reason, they are ontological proofs, cosmological proofs, and teleological proofs. Four different, three different types of evidences that non-Muslims or those non-Muslims that believe in God give. Ontological proof, what is that? It is possible to think that God exists, so therefore God must exist. It's ontological. Teleological. Teleological proof is, uh, God is a good thing. There are many good things on this earth. So therefore, God must have caused the good things, so therefore God exists. This is the teleological proof. Cosmological proof. Where did the universe come from? Something would have caused the universe to come into existence. God is a being that can cause the universe to come into existence, and therefore God exists. These are the evidences that non-Muslims use to prove God exists. These are the non-Muslims that believe in the existence of God. As for the Islamic proof for the existence of God, it is neither teleological or ontological or cosmological. The evidences of the existence of God are the four things that the Quran and the Sunnah tells us. What are the four evidences of the existence of God? Number one, number one, the first evidence of the existence of God are the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا لَكُمْ لَا تَرْجُونَ لِلَّهِ وَقَارًا وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ أَطْوَارًا أَلَمْ تَرَوْا كَيْفَ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا So this is the ayat. These are the ayat of Allah, the sun, the moon, the stars. Have you not seen the seven heavens? Look at the heavens. How perfect it is. Is not that a sign of the existence of the Creator? Right, so the signs of Allah is number one evidence of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islamic evidence of the existence of God is very different from the Islamic, uh, the non-Islamic evidence that is given by people to prove God exists. That's number one, are the ayat of Allah. Number two are the stories of the prophets. As Ibn Hazm rahimahullah had said, he said, if the only thing that we had was the seerah of the Prophet sallam, and not the Quran or, the, or anything else, we only had the seerah, then this would have been enough to prove that God exists. Because no man would have behaved like this. No man would have behaved the way Muhammad Sallallahu behaved, except that he truly was a messenger sent by God. So, Ikhwati, the second evidence of the existence of God are the stories of the messengers, the story of Ibrahim, the story of Adam, the story of Nuh alayhi salam, all the prophets of God, how they all call to the same message. Evidence number two. Evidence number three. Evidence number three is the challenge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about our khalq. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun. The only verse in the Quran that challenges us and asks us to believe that God exists. The only verse in the Quran. Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun. Did they create themselves or were they created out of nothing? Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in. Did they come out of existence from nothing? Am humul khaliqun, did they create themselves? How could you have created yourself if you didn't exist? So you couldn't have done it. Or did, did you come into existence spontaneously? No, that's not, that's not possible. So therefore something must have caused you to come into existence. And that is the only possibility that is Allah Azzawajal. One verse, Allah stops all your logical, all, all, all your logical uh, uh, arguments. One verse, Am khuliqun min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun. This is evidence number three. Evidence number four is the fitra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put inside our hearts. What is the fitra? The fitra, as Ibn, as Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah has explained, is the ability of every human being to recognize Allah. Fitra is not Islam. Fitra is the ability to recognize Tawheed, the ability to recognize the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the four evidences of the oneness of Allah in our hearts. The fitra in your soul, that is in your hearts. The ayat of Allah in our creation. The challenge of Allah about our khalq and the stories of the prophets of God. All of these will be used by Nuh والسلام, to tell his people, why don't you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, the last part of this surah, Nuh والسلام, will talk about why is it that people don't believe. Why? Because they have followed these other idols. They have followed these human beings just because they have more wealth and more money 
these human beings, these leaders of or devils or shayateen al ins, they're the ones who have motivated human beings, motivated the people to not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So people have chosen to believe them because they consider them to be trustworthy or somehow of some sort of authority to speak about this matter. So they follow these Sanadid al-Kuffar or the leaders of the Kuffar and they listen to them when they said, no, don't believe in God, etc. Or don't believe that these idols are not true. They are true, etc. And people choose to believe them. This is the problem. Today, Ikhwati, what has destroyed the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What has destroyed the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Abdullah ibn Mubarak radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, nothing has destroyed the ummah except for corrupt rulers and corrupt scholars. Corrupt rulers and corrupt scholars. It's true. When the rulers are corrupt and when the scholars are corrupt, then the ummah is destroyed. When the rulers are upright and when the scholars are upright, the ummah is upright. Is that not the case? Absolutely. So, Ikhwati, today, if we follow corrupt scholars, if we follow people who say that they are right but they're not right, and they're corrupt, then we will be led into misguidance just like the people of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. Finally, the Quran will end the surah by Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam making dua to Allah, oh Allah, destroy the people of this dunya. Destroy them all. La tadar ala al ardi min al kafirina dayyara. Do not leave even one disbeliever on the face of this earth. Inna ka in tadarhum. This is the conviction of Nuh So come, let's start with Surah Nuh and learn about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in this beautiful surah about the story of our beloved Prophet Nuh alayhi rahman rahim In the name of Allah, the most merciful to all beings, Ar rahman meaning the one who is merciful to everything in existence. That, that you can see and that you cannot see, that you know of and that you don't know of as well, both Muslim and non-Muslim, the one who is merciful to everything in existence, Ar-Rahim, the one who is merciful specifically to, to the believers only. Inna, verily we, inna arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi. Indeed, we sent nuhan, meaning nuh, to, to his people, ila qawmihi. Very important, ikhwati, the da'i, calls his people by his people. You are my people, even if they're non-believers. So I'm from Australia, for example. I can call my people, all oh, my people. You're my people. You're Australian. I'm Australian. So you're my people. Ila qawmihi. So Nuh was sent to his people. An anzir qawmaka. And that is what the scholars of Islam say. The asl is, a da'i should be from his people. The asl is, the da'i should be from his people. I used to ask my teachers in Medina University saying, hey, Sheikh, why is it when you come to Australia, you always look for the white Aussies and, you know, I mean, we are also Muslim, you accept us as well. And the Sheikh used to recite this verse and say, Inna arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi. Okay, the asul is the people, the da'i is from his people. So, Rasulullah was sent to his people, Nuh was sent to his people, Isa was sent to his people, alayhi salatu wasalam. Inna arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi an andir qawmaka in order to warn your people min qabili before ayyatiyahum adabun alim before the punishment of allah the terrible punishment the alim means the terrible punishment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to them and this is important because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran allah will never punish a people wa ma kunna mu'adhibina hatta nab'atha rasula we will never punish until we send a prophet so that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided not to punish them until he sent Nuh alayhi to them. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned in the authentic tafsir, he said that for about 10 generations after the death of Adam alayhi salam, the people were upon Tawheed. However, towards the ninth and 10th generation, the people who were very righteous began to die and people felt sorry for them and they started to build mausoleums and statues and pictures of them. And then of course, shaitan came to them and said, worship them. That is how shirk entered upon them. And that is at that point that Nuh alayhi salam was sent uh, to these people. Qala ya qawmi. So he started off by saying, ya qawmi. What does that mean by when you say ya qawmi? Meaning that he is drawing relevance to his people. He is associating himself that I am from you. So I have the same maslaha and the same issues on my mind. 
I understand your problems. I understand your concerns. I understand your background. So I am from you. And I am not from a different people trying to impose something on you. I am from you trying to tell you what is important to you. He's, uh, he's trying to build rapport and rapport with the people. Verily, O my people, I am a manifest warner to you all. Ya akhwati, today, if we were to tell our people and warn them, the very first thing people would tell you, that guy has no hikmah. Isn't that true? That guy is too harsh. As we say in Malay, right? In Malaysia, you become too harsh if you tell people, no, 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 right? Over here, I know, uh, in Malaysia, the people have such beautiful akhlaq, uh, but unfortunately, they take it to a level where they, uh, they consider harshness to be not harsh, <laughs> something which is not harshness to be harshness. But this is really harsh to you. I am a warner to you. <laughs> I'm warning you, Jahannam. <laughs> you know, so it sounds harsh, doesn't it? It sounds harsh. But Ikhwati, this is the Hidayat al-Quran. This is the guidance of the Quran. Warn them before Jahannam comes to them. Warn them before the fire comes to them. Because that's the true success. First save yourself from Jahannam, then enter Jannah. Oh my people, verily I'm a manifest warner to you all. <clears throat> that you should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear Him and obey Him. Meaning worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means fearing and obeying. Meaning worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means avoiding that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to avoid and ati'u meaning to do that which he has commanded you to do. That is the essence of worship. Essence of worship is to do what he has told us to do and not do that which he has told us not to do. That's the essence of worship. And that is the essence of, of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the Prophet sallallahu and the messengers for. To perfect tawheed al-ibadah. And that's the essence. Today we think that the essence of the Qur'an is to say God exists. No, the essence of the Qur'an is to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the only one that should be worshipped. And that is why the first message of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam was Worship him, fear him, and then obey him. So ikhwati, this is the essence of the religion of the Prophets of God. That their first message was to correct Tawheed al-Ibadah which is the Tawheed of worship. It was not to correct the Tawheed of Rububiyyah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, or the names, attributes of Allah. No, it was to correct their worship of God. So ask yourself, what is it that we are doing today? What is as us as Da'is, or if you're a part of a Da'wah organization, what is the first thing that you are concentrating on with your people as well? Is it really calling people to the Tawheed of Ibadah of Allah Zawajal or not? Lakum, if you do that, Allah will forgive you. Yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum, min, min, meaning, min ba'di dhunubikum. Yani he will forgive some of your sins, meaning, if you accept Islam, then he will forgive some of your sins, meaning your sins preceding that of Islam. As for the sins after you sin after Islam, then that, that reads, needs another repentance. And this is why he said, and the scholar of the sea says, he said, Yaghfir lakum min dhunubikum. He will forgive from your sins. And He will give you respite. Until an appointed time. What is an appointed time? It is your death. Verily when the time of Allah comes. When it comes. It cannot ever be stopped. If only you knew. So we know that therefore the time of a death can never be changed. However the scholars of Islam do point out that some of the qadr can be changed. And like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La yaruddu al-qadr illa dua Nothing can repel qadr except dua. Authentic hadith in Bukhari, Muslim and others. How do we understand this? Well, we understand that there is an ultimate qadr, which is the qadr in lawh al-mahfuz. That is something that will never change. That is what is being referred to here. Inna ajal Allahi idha ja la yukharu la kuntum ta'alamun. What has been referred to is the ajal that has been written for you in the Loh al mahfuz However, there are other qadr as well. What are the other types of qadr? The other types of qadr that are there are the, is, the, is the daily qadr, is the yearly qadr, is your uh, lifelong qadr. These are all the qadrs that can be changed. When, what are these qadrs? The yearly qadr 
is the Qadr that is revealed on Laylatul Qadr. Right? Laylatul Qadr, the yearly Qadr for the next year is revealed. Uh, and the daily Qadr is the Qadr that comes down at Asr and at, at, uh, at Fajr, where the angels are told what will happen to you in the next uh, uh, 12 hours when they interchange. And the, uh, the, the lifelong Qadr is the Qadr that the angel writes down when he is in the womb after 120 days he writes down so is he going to be happy or sad is he going to uh, be a muslim or non-muslim etc that is a lifelong qadr so these are the three qadrs that can change according to uh, imam al-tahawi rahimullah in his aqidah tahawiya as for the the the, the qadr that is in lawh al-mahfuz and that can never change so the qadr in lawh al-mahfuz contains the following information uh, it contains that Allah will decree that that person will live for 70 years, but then that person will sin and then Allah will bring it down to 50 years. Then his mother will make dua for him, it will increase to 60 years. And then his, uh, his, uh, he will do a good deed for which Allah will increase his, his reward and he will live for 70 years. But then he will sin again, it will bring down to 65. Then he will make tawbah to Allah and Allah will bring it to 75. And then he will die at 75. So the Loh al Mahfud contains the details in that extreme detail. Does that make sense? Tayyip. This is how we understand how the Loh al Mahfud, the Qadr and Loh al Mahfud, which can never change, interacts with the other Qadr that can change. And for more information, you can go back to the books uh, of the scholars regarding Qadr, Qadr, and Qadr. Tayyip. <coughs> يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخِّرُكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى إِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ إِذَا جَاءَ لَا يُؤَخَّرُ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Indeed, when the time of Allah comes, it can never be stopped if only you knew. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes Nuh alayhi sallallahu salam as he makes dua to Allah at the depths of the night and calling Allah azawajal, beseeching Allah and complaining to Allah only. He says, قَالَ رَبِّي He says, O oh my Lord, إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِ لَيْلَ وَالنَّهَارَ Verily, O oh my Lord, I called my people Layla wa Nahara in the morning and the night. Look at the persistence of this da'i in the morning and the night. How many times do we call our people? Wallahi, today we resemble Yunus alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a da'wah than we resemble Nuh alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a da'wah. Yunus alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, of course, he called his people to the da'wah and then he left it for a little while, did he not? However, however, Nuh alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he persisted and called them despite the people disbelieving in him. How many people were there on the fulk, on the ship, when, uh, when totally the people disbelieved in him, everyone was, else was drowned? How many people believed in him? The scholars of the sea say only 71 people. Only 71 people. Only 71 were with him on that ship. That's it. That's all the number of people that were actually saved at the time of Nuh alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa so as you can see, after calling 950 years to the path of Allah, subhanAllah, they all, the only, subhanAllah, only 71 people actually believed in Him. So if you judge people by their results, if you judge a human being simply by their results, then you would consider that Nuh salam is not as effective as uh, Zakir Naik or as effective as uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, what's the Sheikh from South Africa, forgotten his name. Huh? Ahmed Didat, Rahimahullah, Rahmatan Wasi'a. Sheikh Ahmed Didat had thousands of people accepting Islam. Yeah, he, mashallah, you look at his compared to Nuh alayhi salam. So this is why never judge people according to outcomes. Outcomes are up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Results are up to Allah. But rather, uh, what we know is the persistence of Nuh was enough for the people of the earth to accept Islam. That is how we should judge people, how much effort they put into it rather than the results that they ultimately achieved at the end. I call people in the morning and at night. Falam yazidhum du'ai. So their du'a did not increase them. Falam yazidhum du'ai illa firara. Except to run away from me. Their du'a, my du'a to them, meaning calling upon them, did not increase them in anything except firara, meaning except running away from me. Of course, who would want to listen to someone who is just constantly calling to the path of Allah unless you really wanted to believe in it? Yeah? So every time I kept on persisting and calling, that they kept on running away from me. But he still persisted. And even though, this, despite them running away, I persisted on calling them, 
لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ So that you might forgive them. جَعَلُوا What did they do? أَصَابِعَهُمْ Their fingers. جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ In their in their ears. Meaning, they didn't want to listen to me at all. So much so that when they saw me there, they would put their fingers in their ears like this. So they couldn't hear me at all. جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ Istighsha means to do talab al ghashi, which means to actually take your thob and to put it all over you. Meaning, you don't want them to be recognized or you don't want to see them. So, what you do is you take your thob or your uh, garment, for example. Oh, is that no? Good, quick, you know, you know how you put your thob like that and you just move your eyes away, ears away? That's what they did. They turned their face away, they covered their face with their cloth. وَأَصَرُّوا And they persisted in their arrogance. وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا stikbara, And they continued in their pride with a huge amount of pride and istikbar and arrogance. ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُهُمْ jihara. Then I called them publicly. Publicly I would stand in the markets and I would call out to them. I would stand on the minarets, I would call out to them. I would go up to their most busiest of places, I would call to them. ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُهُمْ jihara. Then I called out to them and I said, whoever wants to meet me one-on-one, -on -one, come and see me here. And then I met them secretly, meaning one-on-one -on -one as well. So he met them one-on-one. -on -one. He told them publicly. He told them where to meet him. He called out to them. He did every single thing possible. The question is why? Why was he so persistent? Because he loved his people. Because a da'i must love his people, ya khuti. Today, we fail to call to the da'wah because our love for our people is deficient. If we truly loved our people, we truly cared, and truly wanted to save them from Jahannam, and truly believed in the promise of Allah that indeed if they don't change, Allah will burn them in the fire. If we truly believed in this, and we truly loved our people, then we should persist like our Prophet Wasallam and Nuh Wasallam persisted. Despite all difficulty and all trials, they persisted. In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that uh, he, he told us an authentic hadith in, in, in Bukhari that the persistence of the prophets was so much so that one of the prophets was being, his hair was being torn from his head and he was being dragged to be killed by his people and this guy took out a sword to cut his neck, the prophet of God, right? So a prophet of God was being dragged by his hair and a sword was being lifted to cut his neck off and the prophet of God raised his hand and said, Rabbi, forgive my people for innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive my people for they don't know. In Surah Yaseen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about this man who comes from the Aqsa al-Madina. وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْصَى الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اتَّبِعُوا الْمُرْسَلِينَ اتَّبِعُوا مَنْ لَا يَسْأَلُكُمْ أَجْرَ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ وَمَا لِيَ لَا أَعْبُدُ الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ أَأَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ دُونِهِ آلِهَةً إِنْ يُرِدِنَ الرَّحْمَنُ بِضُرٍّ لَا تُغْنِي عَنْهِ شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا As you know, this man came from the, the farthest part of the village. Three messengers were sent to that uh, people. Still they didn't believe. And what did they do to this man? They ultimately finally killed him. When they killed him, Allah gave him a reward, forgave him. What did he say? Allah quotes him saying, Ya layta qawmi a'lamun. How I wish my people knew how Allah has forgiven me. Meaning, even after his death and his people killing him, he had love for the people in his heart. So my brothers and my sisters in Islam, my question to you is how much do you love human beings? How much do you love them? How much do you care for them? How much do you really worry for them and their future? How much do you love them? And that is why Ikhwati, the Prophet Sallallahu was warned by the Prophet, by Allah Azawajal, that lest Allah keeps him stable, his love for the people would have tended to bend him towards compromising the religion. If we didn't give you thabat of Muhammad Sallallahu your love for humanity would have caused you to overlook some of the obligations of, the, of, the, of Islam and make it easy for them and to accept just, just in order to have them accept Islam. And that's why a believer must ennoble himself with love. He must ennoble himself with love for his people that he's calling to. If you don't do that, you'll never be a perfect da'i. 
you because you'll never ever call people enough and you'll call once and then you'll have you lose your patience it was reported that abdullah ibn mubarak radiallahu ta'ala anhu that he had a jewish neighbor <coughs> and he used to call this jewish neighbor to islam and he called him for 20 years to islam but this jewish neighbor never accepted islam until after 20 years the khalifa came to the jewish neighbor or the emissary of the khalifa came and said we are extending the road we need to buy your house so we can demolish it and so we can extend the road this way. So the Jewish neighbor said, okay, I want 2,000 gold coins. So the emissary of the Khalifa said, why do you want 2,000? All your guys, all the people on this road are asking for 1,000. Why are you asking for 2,000? So uh, the Jewish guy said, he said, I want 1,000 for my house and I want 1,000 for being the neighbor of Abdullah bin Mubarak. So Ikhwati, my point to you is that whether you realize it or not, even though your family might not be listening to your da'wah, even though your people may be rejecting your da'wah, they are feeling your Im impact. They know your value. They know your value. The people of Yunus والسلام, knew the value of Yunus. They were simply being, being silly. They were simply being arrogant. When Yunus left, then they all said, oh my God, punish because Allah is going to come quickly. Let's accept Islam. They accepted Islam. So don't ever think that your value is not felt by the people you're calling to. They know your value. So persist and continue on calling to the path of Allah. Something is stopping them. Some shaitan, some doubt in their heads is stopping them. Soon the doubt will be removed and Allah will make them accept the deen, inshallah. So be impatient and do every single thing possible, private, public, open and secret. Every way that you can think of calling people to Allah, azawajal, never ever stop. And indeed, indeed, people will respond one day, inshallah ta'ala. فَقُلْتُ ثُمَّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ لَهُمْ وَأَسْرَرْتُ لَهُمْ إِسْرَارًا What did I tell them? What was the essence of my, my speech to them? فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I told them the essence of my, my speech with them was please accept Islam. Please repent to Allah. إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to forgive. Ya akhwati, repentance is the essence of ibadah. The essence of ibadah is repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in Sahih al Sahih Bukhari in Muslim, he said, The best friends of Allah are the ones who repent the most. The best friends of Allah are the ones who repent the most. The ones who say, Astaghfirullah, 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 continuously. The Prophet ﷺ, in every gathering, 70 to 100 times, they used to say that he would not go from his chair, rise up from his chair, until he had repented to Allah more than 100 times. It was reported that Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, whenever I have something that is difficult upon me, I repent to Allah more than a thousand times. I say astaghfirullah more than a thousand times until Allah makes the issue easy and clear to me. Ya ikhwati, repentance is beautiful. It will ennoble you. Allah will give you rewards. Allah will forgive you. Allah will love you. Allah will care for you. Allah will give you everything your heart's desire if you simply repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's look at what Nuh والسلام, said are the benefits of repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said in verse number 11 in Surah Nuh, يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا, meaning repent to Allah. He will send you the clouds laden with rain. What is midrar? Midrar means tikraran, yani, again after again. Meaning more clouds after more clouds after more clouds is coming. You know how the clouds are coming and you can see the clouds moving very fast. So that's what he meant. By midrara meaning cloud after cloud after cloud, all laden with rain, he will send you. Yursil is sama alaykum midrara. He will send you the clouds laden with rain again and again and again. Wa yumdidukum and he will increase you. What will he increase you in? Wa yumdidukum bi amwal. He will give you more wealth. Hey, meaning repenting to Allah will make you rich. Subhanallah, is that so? Absolutely. Repenting to Allah. Nuh says, And he'll give you more money. And he'll give you more children. And he'll give you rivers from which to cultivate your crops. And he'll give you so much ponds and lakes from which to cultivate and feed your crops from. Ya in this, in this uh, verse, which is verse number 12 in Surah Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam tells him the benefits of repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ikhwati, what are the strategies of getting rich? If you attend a lecture on how to get rich or you buy a book on how to get rich, the first thing says, okay, stop spending too much money. 
Number, number, three, number two, they'll say, okay, uh, start doing a business on which you're passionate about. Okay, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just imagining what they would say. Uh, book, uh, uh, strategy number three, uh, uh, invest in real estate. 97% of those people who got rich, got rich by investing in real estate. Uh, number uh, four, uh, invest in, in stock market for the long term. Don't, don't invest for the short term, right? Uh, number five, invest in uh, gold and silver because that's uh, more profitable than anything else, right? I'm just giving you some investment tips, guys, okay? Uh, and uh, if you uh, really want to make a lot of money, don't get married now because marriage is very expensive, uh, right? Don't have, and also don't have more than two kids, right? Because kids are very expensive. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yusuf, what can I do, Baba? So, uh, this is the, uh, the get rich quick guide, right? Tofik Chaudhary's get, get rich quick guide, isn't it? And, you know, anyone can make a guide these days. The seven secrets of getting rich, and, and, you know, you can make a lot of money from that. So, the point of the matter is the Islamic strategy of getting rich is very different from the non Muslim strategy of getting rich. Hey? What is the Muslim strategy of getting rich? You've heard the non-Muslim strategy of getting rich. Now let me tell you the Islamic strategy of getting rich. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever wants to get rich, let him do Hajj. Authentic hadith of Rasulullah ﷺ. Whoever wants to get rich, let him do Hajj. Wow, really? That doesn't make sense. Hajj is $10,000. <laughs> Hajj is $10,000, isn't it? How much ringgit is it? 30,000 ringgit, 20,000 ringgit, right? Yeah, if you want a, a good hotel, right? It's 20,000 ringgit, man. How are we going to get rich? But Allah, Allah works in different ways. Okay? He said, whoever wants to get rich, then do hajj. Another second hadith. Look at this one. Authentic hadith in Tabarani and others. The Prophet said, whoever wants to get rich, let him get married. <gasps> what? Does it make sense? <laughs> Completely illogical, isn't it? Whoever wants to get rich, let him get married. And all the brothers are, mashallah. Another, yet another reason to get, get married, isn't it? MashaAllah. <laughs> to get rich. It's true. Whoever wants to get rich, let him get married. It doesn't make sense. But that's the whole point. Allah, if you believe Allah is the source of income, if you believe Allah is the one who gives you wealth and money, then do what Allah will, will tell you to do. Money will come. Money will come. You must have that faith. Our mushkila is we look for different ways of making money like the non-Muslims do. But we should look at how, how our Prophet ﷺ told us to make money. Okay? How many camels did the Prophet ﷺ slaughter in his last Hajj? How many camels? 100 camels? I mean, subhanAllah, the Prophet was so poor, he had 100 camels? That's the whole point. Even if you're poor, if you do what Allah tells you to do, wealth will come to you and you won't even know where it's coming from. Another authentic hadith, I still remember, my Sheikh was telling me, uh, this hadith which is in Sahih Muslim. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and then he went to his people and said, Ya qawmi, aslimu, aslimu. Oh my people, accept Islam, accept Islam. Why? فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا يُعْطِيَ عَطَاءَ رَجِلٍ لَا يَخْشَى الْفَقَرِ Verily, Muhammad ﷺ gives the giving of a man who doesn't fear poverty. What did the Prophet ﷺ give him? He gave him a valley of sheep, a valley of sheep, a valley of sheep. The scholars of a hadith mentioned more than 880 herds of sheep. 880. And I'm thinking, oh my God, where did the Prophet have that much sheep to give even? And that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Is that when you run for the Akhirah, the dunya will run for you. And that is why Al-Hassan Al-Basri, Rahimallah, he said, Ya ayyuh shabab oh young men and young women, I'malu lil Akhirah, work for the Akhirah. For verily I have seen in my life that anyone who works for the Akhirah, Allah also gives him the dunya. But I have never seen in my life that anyone who works only for the dunya ever gets anything from the akhirah. So work for the akhirah, ya akhwati. Work for the akhirah. Seek with your time and your effort to do for that which, for that which is right for the akhirah. Money will come, wealth will come, and you will not even know where it is coming from. Bi'idhnillah. Tayyib, ya akhwati. So the get rich quick method methodology of Islam is very different. Tawbah is another, another example. The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith in Abu Dawood, he said, <clears throat> he said, nothing stops a person's rizq from coming from him, coming to him except his dhunub, except his sins. Nothing stops the wealth that Allah has written for you from coming to you except your sins. So the more you sin, the more you get, you get poor. The less you sin, the more richer you get. The more repentance you do, which removes your sin, the more richer you get. 
So can you see the Islamic strategy of getting rich is so different, isn't it? Also, if you're, if you're struggling to have a baby, if you're struggling to have a baby, istighfar, istighfar, istighfar. Because that's what Nuh said. And he'll give you children. Subhanallah. So make more tawbah. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. Continuously, ikhwati. Continuous tawbah and you'll see from nowhere, inshallah, inshallah, you'll have more and more children. Okay? Make continuous istighfar, especially if you're having difficulty having kids, right? And, and you know, sometimes Allah tests us with this difficulty. So please, ya ikhwati, if you're having difficulty, then please make istighfar. And that's why, ya ikhwati, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Maryam, that's exactly how Zakaria started, yeah? Uh, Zakaria started making dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. Rabbi inni wa hana al-adhu minni wa sta'ala ra'su shayba wa lam akum bi du'aika rabbi shaqiyya. Oh Allah, look at me, my bones have become weak, my hair has become white. Oh Allah, you don't reject my dua, oh Allah. So can you see how he's making dua to Allah for a child? So in the same way, ikhwati, repent to Allah, repent, 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 and Allah will give you children, bi'idhnillah. And if you're facing economic distress, like Malaysia, the economy goes down. Stop trying to take loans from the IMF. Institute salah and repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with repentance. Indeed, our wealth will grow bi idhnillah. <coughs> Tayyib. What is wrong with you that you do not seek a wiqar? What is wiqar? Wiqar means a safety. So what is wrong with you that you do not seek a means of safety from Allah? Meaning, as, as, as an excuse in front of Allah that will give you safety from His punishment. What is wrong with you that you do not seek a means of safety from Allah's punishment by repenting to Him, by praying to Him, by giving charity? What's wrong with you? وَقَدْ خَلَقَكُمْ atwara. Whilst He has created you atwar, atwar meaning in levels. How has He created you in levels? Well, in the... In the womb of our, of our parents, we were nutfa, then alaqa, then mudgha, then we became a human being. And the soul was blown into us. Then we were an infant, then a child, then we were a teenager, then we became an adult. After that, we become an old man, and then a frail old person, and then we die. Atwara. Or he gave us death, then he gave us life, then he'll give us death, then he'll give us life again. So atwara in different stages. What is wrong with you that you do not believe in Allah? The one who has created you in different stages. Can you not see how you have progressed in your life and how you were young and then now you are old? Alam tarau kayfa khalaq Allahu sab'a samawat intibaqa. Now Nuh alayhi salatu salam is going to tell the first verse over there. Wa qad khalaqu atwara is to talk about how you came into existence. Remember we said the four reasons. The four reasons to believe in God. One is our existence. How we were created. So that is what Nuh was referring to by saying, Now he's going to talk about the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that should show you how Allah exists. What are the signs that Nuh is talking about? Alam tarau kayfa khalaq Allah sab'a samawat intibaqa. Have you not seen how Allah has created the seven heavens all above you, towering all above you? Waja'al al qamara fihinna nura. And he has put the qamar within it, a light, something that emits light. Waja'al al shamsa siraja. And he has made the shams a sun, something that emits the light. And this is a miracle of the Quran because the sun was called the siraj whilst the qamar was called the nur. So we know nur is something that emits the light. We know our bodies don't have light, but it emits the light out. And we know the sun has a light and the light comes and it's the source is the sun itself. So this is a miracle of the Quran that the Quran told us from early on that the moon is a reflector, whereas the sun is an emitter of light. Yeah, because of the particular words that have been used. So the moon is called nur, whereas the shams, shams is called the siraj. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا وَاللَّهُ أَنْبَتَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ نَبَاتًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused you to grow from the earth just like He caused the crops to grow from the earth as well. Meaning He recreated you just like He recreated, he created all other uh, creations from the earth as well. ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا Then He will cause you to be returned therein. Then He will cause you to come up again. 
Ya Ikhwati, in the depths of the night, when you ponder on your creation, when you ponder on the seven heavens, when you ponder upon how you will die and then you'll come up, does this not fill your heart with Iman about the existence of Allah? It does, Wallahi. When you think about the signs of Allah, it only increases you in Iman. I remember my brothers and sisters in Islam, I used to be an atheist uh, uh, in my life before. Yes, I was born into a Muslim family, but then my, fa my friends, my teachers at school made me an atheist. And I remember when I went entered into, into medicine at the age of 17, uh, and I went into medicine, I only really believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when I was dissecting human beings. When I was dissecting, I had this really, really fat lady who was uh, my dissection uh, cadaver, subhanAllah. It took so long to get through, all, uh, through everything, but then once I got into it, I was amazed at the creation of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the heart, the liver, how, how every single thing has been created in the body of the human being. That is when I felt the first, you know, tinges of Iman in the heart, really. Subhanallah, it is the khalq of Allah and the, uh, and the, and the amazing mystery of the creation of human beings that, that, uh, that causes uh, people to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلَ الْقَمَرَ فِيهِنَّ نُورًا وَجَعَلَ الشَّمْسَ سِرَاجًا وَاللَّهُ أَنْبَتَكُمْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ نَبَاتًا ثُمَّ يُعِيدُكُمْ فِيهَا وَيُخْرِجُكُمْ إِخْرَاجًا وَاللَّهُ جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ بِسَاطًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the earth widespread wide out, soft and gentle so you can, you can run on it. Have you seen the rough barren lands? You couldn't have done anything on it. If the earth was barren and rough, you could not have drilled, you could not have built anything, you could not have walked on it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it soft and easy for us to do so. Wallahu ja'ala lakum arda bisata. He made the earth wide outstretched so you can live on, the, live on it and travel in it. لِتَسْلُكُوا مِنْهَا سُبُلًا fijaja, So that you may take therein paths, uh, paths therein to travel therein. Ya ikhwati, these are all signs of Allah. Mountains, the paths, the, uh, the oceans, the sky, the food, the water, every single thing are signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قَالَ نُوحُ الرَّبِّ إِنَّهُمْ عَصَوْنِ After 950 years, Nuh then didn't make that dua, then he started making this last dua. What is this dua? He said, Oh Allah, they have not listened to me. After 950 years, he makes this dua. إِنَّهُمْ عَصَوْنِ وَاتَّبَعُوا مَنْ لَمْ يَزِدْهُ مَالُهُ وَوَلَدُهُ إِلَّا خَسَارُ Oh Allah, they have not listened to me. They have decided to reject me and they have decided to follow those who their wealth and their children have not increased them in anything except khasara, except misguidance. Meaning, what causes people to become misguided today, ya khwati? What causes people today to become misguided? What causes them to become misguided is that they have wealth and children. Simple. As Allah says in Surah Qalam, yeah? in Surah Al Qalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, why is it that they don't listen? It's because they have the mal, they have wealth and children. In the same way, their wealth and the children don't please them in anything except misguidance. So today, equity, the arrogant people today, they think they are strong and big and haughty and proud because they have wealth and they have children. That is why, equity, they think that they are on the top of the game. Allah loves them somehow. So Allah has given them more wealth and more children. Whereas wealth and children are meant to be a test for us. A test for us, whether we use them in the right way or not. So my brothers and sisters of Islam, do not be, fear, do not be, uh, do, do not be uh, uh, deceived by your wealth and the fact that you have kids. Do not be deceived at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given uh, 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 other people wealth and children as well. He has given uh, he has given shayateen. Uh, he has given Iblis. Do you know how many children Iblis has? He has far more than you, trust me. Uh, in the authentic narration, it is reported that every single time a children of Adam is born, another shaitan is born as well. So the number of children of Iblis is like the number of children of Adam. Allahu Akbar. So uh, I don't know about you, does that mean therefore Allah loves Iblis? <laughs> Just because he has much more children than you? No, it doesn't. So just because you have more kids, please don't fall into that thinking, MashaAllah, hamse bada kaun hai? And who is bigger than me, greater than me? No one really greater than me. No, no. It might just be a test for you. Okay? Because you are going to be responsible for guiding them to Islam and to Iman. Otherwise, you will feel their, you'll feel the effect of their sins as well. Tayyip. 
قال نوح الرب إنهم عصوني they have disbelieved in me واتبعوا and they followed من لم يزده those who did not increase them their wealth and their and their children إلا خسارة except for misguidance ومكروا مكرا كبارا and they have mocked me with a severe mocking what is this مكروا مكرا كبارا well what happened is in the tafsir uh, of this uh, of uh, uh, of this verse it is reported that the salaf said that after 950 years, the people got so fed up with Nuh that the rich people told the ignorant ones and the, the less knowledgeable ones amongst them to plot a plan to kill Nuh Okay, That is the Makaru Makran Kubbara, right? What did they do? The rich did not do it themselves, but they paid off the, 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 uh, the lowly people, right? And the evil ones, they paid them and they convinced them to hatch a plan to kill me. So, Yehuti, this is what's going to happen. If you call to the path of Allah, and you persist in calling to the path of Allah, then people are going to fight you. And that is why in Surah Fatiha, have you noticed? When, do, when you say, Iyaka na'budu, you say right after that, Iyaka nasta'een. You only, we, you, uh, only you we, we worship oh Allah. And then right after that, Iyaka nasta'een. Only you do we seek help. Why? Because if you only worship Allah, then you will be fought in this dunya. People will try to harm you and kill you. And so you must seek the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? Right. That's why next time you say, you must know, Ya Rabbi, we need your help because people are plotting and planning to harm us already. Shaitan is plotting and planning. An unseen army is waiting to harm us. And his cronies from the human beings are also waiting to harm us, Ya Rabbi. So we need your help and your protection. Right. وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا And they plotted and planned a very significant plot and plan. وَقَالُوا And they said, لَا تَذَرُنَّ Do not leave. Do not leave. لَا تَذَرُنَّ means this is in the سِيغَةُ الْتَشْدِيدِ Right? In the سِيغَةُ where, uh, where people are being told of a surety most definitely do not at all leave. Okay? You can say don't leave. Or you can say, don't you dare leave, right? This one is referring to, don't you dare leave. Okay, in a very severe way, they are, they are telling the people, قَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ Your gods. وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ And do not dare leave. Waddan, The god whose name is Wad. وَلَا سُعَى وَلَا يَغُوثْ وَلَا يَعُوق وَلَا نَصْرَى The five gods that they mentioned. Don't leave your gods, and especially these five gods, don't leave them at all. Ya khuti, how many gods are there? How many gods? One? One? No, that's, that's not true. That's wrong. There are millions of gods. I'm not joking, and this is not a mockery or joke. It's true, wallahi, there are millions of gods. Because what is a god? A god is an object of worship. A god is an object of worship. So there are millions of gods. But there is only one true god. Correct? A god or aliha is an object of worship. So there are millions of that. How many, how many aliha do the Hindus have? Do you know? The Hindus have more than 370 million gods. Yeah, I read that in one of their books. 370 million gods. And you know Lord Mountbatten? Have you heard of this man called Lord Mountbatten? He was the final uh, 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 viceroy that ruled over India in the year 1945. He is the one who obviously gave uh, the independence to India and then, uh, and then went off. Lord Mountbatten, he said, you know what? The British did everything right in India, but did one thing very wrong. <laughs> what did the, so the British did everything right <laughs> in India, but did one thing very wrong. What did we do? Well, the one thing that they did wrong was that they called the Hindus by one word called Hindu. So they unified them. Otherwise, they were all worshipping different gods. <laughs> so even though their principle was to divide and rule, they unfortunately unified them by calling them one name. Okay? And they unified them by calling them one name. So, Yehwati, this is very important that we, don't, that we uh, learn this lesson, Yehwati, that ultimately there are millions of gods. But there is only one true one, one, only one true deity worthy of worship. And it is because of us thinking that other things are not gods, that is why today there is something called grave worship, why people worship graves. 
But those people that worship graves say, no, this is not worship. This is respect. But we say, no, it is worship. No, it's not worship. It's only respect. I said, but this uh, Hazrat P. Dada Lal, this grave of Hazrat P. Dada Lal, this mausoleum of Hazrat P. I've just made, made up this name called Hazrat P. Dada Lal. It's a made up name. It doesn't exist. But imagine that there's a mausoleum called Hazrat P. Dada Lal, right? And you go to this mausoleum. What do they do? They ask for dua. They touch the grave and put barakah. I said, Subhanallah. How can you say that the grave has barakah? And you assume that, the, that now you have more barakah now because you are there in the vicinity of the grave or touching the grave. Or how do you make dua to the grave? How many verses are there in the Quran to not make dua to anyone other than Allah? How many verses? 500 verses in the Quran. 500 verses in the Quran. How many verses in the Quran? 6,000 verses. That means if 500 verses are there in the Quran out of 6,000 verses, don't you think it's important? Correct? And that's the whole point. When people make dua to someone, Ya Abdul Qadir, Ya Abdul Qadir Jilani. Huh? What is this? I've heard people make this dua. What is this except kufr and shirk? This is nothing but kufr and shirk. Why? Because dua. And that is why the Prophet said, A dua hu al ibadah. Another authentic hadith he said, dua mukhul ibadah. Dua is the heart of ibadah. And there's more than 500 verses in the Quran. Wala tadu'u ma'allahi ilahan akhar. 500 verses to not make dua to anyone else. So therefore, dua, if you were to make it, you will make that person into an ilah. So if you make dua to a being in something that only Allah should be asked for and only Allah should be called for, you have made that person or that entity and ilah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why grave worship is actually worship. It is actually making the grave into a worship and a deity worship, not just respect. So when you prostrate to the grave, don't say, oh, we're prostrating just like, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam prostrated to his, to his uh, 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 when, the, when, the, when Yaqub prostrated to his son Yusuf, uh, as in the surah, alayhi, alayhi salam. No, we, we don't. Because in our time, in our Sharia, prostration is, is ibadah. That's why we cannot. La tasjudu li shamsi wa la lil qamari wa sjudu lillahi ladhi khalaqahunna in kuntum iyyahu ta'budun. That verse has made it that you cannot prostrate anymore out of respect. You can only prostrate out of worship. That is why today prostration and ruku' cannot be done to anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same way, calling upon Allah, dua or istighatha or asking for help, or rain, or wealth, or children. You cannot ask of this from anything or anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And that is why the scholars of Islam say, if someone makes dua to anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have done the worst of shirk. How have they done the worst of shirk? If I, for example, if you see someone sitting here and say, Oh, Abdul Qadir, Aghithni. Oh, yeah, Gawthi Adam, Aghithni. You know, this is very important because half the Muslim Ummah today, unfortunately, have this fascination about the Saint Abdul Qadir Rahimahullah. And uh, Abdul, Abdul Qadir Rahimahullah was a, was a great man. He was a Hanbali scholar, a student of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, who was a righteous man. And it is from the Aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah Jama'ah to believe in the, uh, in the miracles of the awliya. However, that does not make Abdul Qadir somehow someone who can accept your dua. So if you over here make a dua to Abdul Qadir, you have done the worst of shirk. How have you done the worst of shirk? Because all the three types of shirk are, are in there. When you say, Ya Abdul Qadir, that means you think that he can hear you. So that's shirk in Tawheed Asma Sifat. If you're calling upon him, Ya Abdul Qadir, Aghithni, Oh Abdul Qadir, give me help and give me madad and give me safety, then this is asking him for something that he cannot. This is dua. Dua is ibadah. So that is shirk in tawheed uluhiyah. Okay? And then when you say, when you are asking him for safety and for madad, then this is safety and madad only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who sustains you, the one who is your wakil. So therefore, you have made shirk in rububiyah as well. So, ikhwati, Shirk in dua entails shirk in all the three types of, of tawheed. Shirk in dua entails shirk in all the three types of tawheed. So do not do that. And the reason why I'm, I'm 
taking a moment to say this is because this is how shirk has entered into our ummah. That we started to become very attached to the righteous people in our ummah until we built mausoleums and graves over their grave and then we started to worship them. Right? And I remember uh, reading this book called Taqiyat al-Iman, Taqiyat al-Iman, or Imam Shamsuddin, uh, Shamsuddin al-Hindi, uh, a great scholar in India, who was one of the early scholars uh, who used to strive against grave worship in India. He said, Wallahi, I remember that in our village, whoever wanted to make money would simply kill a goat or a donkey, would put his donkey's uh, body in there and put a mausoleum over it and start saying he's a big saint. Yeah, and people would come and, and put money and whatever. It's a bloody donkey in there, man, or a dog or something else. What the heck is that? Is that a holy donkey or something? Any, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? But this is how people are. Who knows what is inside them? How many mausoleums of Abdul Qadir Jilani are there today? I counted 21 mausoleums in the Muslim Ummah today. 21 mazars and mausoleums of Abdul Qadir Jilani today. But there's Abdul Qadir Jilani is only one person. So what's all in, what's the body, what is, who is in the grave of those other 20? Probably Abdul Qadir is donkey or his cat or something else, right? And this is the mushkila yakhwati today. We don't know what's in it. We don't know who, what, how can we worship these things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In the authentic narration which is in Bukhari, at the time of the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha mentioned a hadith. She said that when the Prophet sallallahu was on his deathbed, and he was going through the pains of his death. Then a person came from the travels from Ethiopia and he mentioned about these beautiful palaces and these beautiful churches that he saw in Ethiopia. Amazingly beautiful churches with very amazing, uh, amazing uh, 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 decorations inside the churches. When he saw that uh, and when the Prophet saw, uh, heard that, he said, verily those people are the worst of creation. Though they, when a righteous person dies amongst them, they make a mausoleum over their dead body and then they make it into a place of worship. They are the aswan nasi inda Allah. They are the worst of creation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worst of creation. So, ikhwati, people who do these mausoleums and these grave worships, and this is no doubt a very terrible sin which we should all encourage people to avoid and rid our ummah from. Tayyip. لا تذرن آلهتكم ولا تذرن ودا ولا سعاعا ولا يغوث ويعوق ونصرا وقد أضلوا كثيرا Indeed they have misguided so many people ولا تزد الظالمين إلا ضلالا Oh Allah do not increase the ظالمين except ضلالا This is very important When you commit sin you will do another sin That's why Shaykh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله He says every good deed leads to two good deeds And every sin leads to two sins He said what? In his fatawa, he says, every good deed leads to two good deeds. And every sin leads to two sins. Amazing. Why did he say that? He said, because when you sin, then Allah will guide you to another sin. Because Allah will increase you in more. Because Allah says that Nuh made this dua. وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضلالا. When someone sins, do not increase him in anything except more sin. Meaning, you must, as soon as you sin, stop it immediately or repent and stop the cycle. Because if you continue on and don't repent, you will fall into another sin, which will lead you into another sin, which will lead you into another one. But when you do a good deed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَزِيدُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ هُدَىٰ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase the guidance of those people who are already guided. So when you do a good deed, Allah will guide you to another one, another one, another one. And that is why, ikhwati, if you sin and you know you're sinning, straight away repent to Allah and stop it. Otherwise, you will lead to another sin. Does that make sense? وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالَ Do not increase the ظَالِمِينَ except in misguidance. مِمَّا خَطِيئَاتِهِمْ Because of their sins. أُغْرِقُوا They were all drowned. وَأُدْخِلُوا نَارًا And they were entered the fire. Meaning, how were they drowned and entered the fire? Meaning, they were entered the fire of the barzakh. They were entered the fire of, not of Jahannam, but of the grave. So the fire and the punishment of the grave is true. This is a proof. This verse is a proof that indeed the punishment of grave is true. The only ones who disbelieved in the punishment of the grave were a group of the Jahmiya and the latter, uh, latter groups of the Mu'tazila. They disbelieved in the punishment of the grave. However, the punishment of the grave is from the Aqeedah of Ahl-Sunnah al-Jama'ah. 
to believe in the punishment of the grave. And so this verse shows it, that they were drowned, but they still entered the fire, right? And also uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Sahih al-Bukhari, al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he uh, quotes a chapter of his book saying chapter punishment of the grave. And he quotes in there the verse uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, 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 so this verse was revealed regarding the people of Fir'aun, how they had the worst of punishment. Allah says that the fire is being lit upon them morning at night. And on the day of judgment, it will be said, enter them into the worst of the, of the punishment. So therefore, what is the first fire that has been referred to? It is a fire that they are in right now, meaning they are being burnt in a fire which is in their grave, which is not as hot as the fire of Jahannam, but it is no, nevertheless a terrible torture. And they are being burnt in it right now in the punishment of the grave. So Ikhwati, the punishment of the grave is true. It is true. It will happen. And you must protect yourselves from it. How do you protect yourself from punishment of the grave? Well, we took that. Surah Mulk. Recite Surah Mulk every day. It was reported that Rasulullah never used to go to sleep without reciting Surah Mulk every single day. So every day recite Surah Mulk and protect yourself from the punishment of the grave. Tayyip. Mimma khati'atihim because of their sins. Uhriku, they were punished, they were drowned. Wa udkhilu nara, and they were entered the fire. Falam yajidu lahum min dunillahi ansara. So they did not find anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an ansar with them. Wa qala nuhur rabbi, and Nuh alayhi wa sallam said, O oh my Lord, la tadhar ala al-ard min al-kafirin dayyara. O oh Allah, do not leave ala al-ard upon the earth. Min al kafirin from the disbelievers, the yara, not even a single person. Innaka in tadarhum yudillu ibadaka. If you leave them, they will misguide your slaves. Wala yalidu illa fajir al kafara. And they will not give birth to anyone except a fajir, a arrogant sinner who will sin against you, O oh Allah. Rabbi ghfirli, O oh Allah, forgive me. So the dua of Nuh alayhi wa sallam after he was told that no one else would believe on this earth is that he made a dua against all the disbelievers. And the dua of the prophets is acceptable, correct? The dua of the prophets is accepted. So today, that's right. If people persist in their disbelief, Allah, will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will offer surety, give them terrible punishment. Ya Ikhwati, I have a question for you before I, I go to the last verse of that surah. And that is, we know that the people of Nuh were drowned. We know the people of of Lut alayhi salatu salam were killed by the, uh, the, the cities being turned upside down. We know the people of Salih, which is Thamud, were destroyed by the sound. We know the people of Ad, which is the people of Hud alayhi salatu salam, were destroyed by the Rihan Sarsara, which is the very severe cold wind that destroyed them. Correct? We know that. Why is it that today, today, so many nations disbelieve in Allah, but they are not being destroyed. All the natural disasters are coming to Muslim world. Why is it? Why is it? Sorry? Because we don't do the work of the prophets. We don't call people to Islam anymore. We don't spend our life doing that. I mean, how many Islamic universities are there worldwide? No less than 70 Islamic universities worldwide. How many graduates are Islamic universities producing? No less than 200,000 graduates. How many of them are actually doing the our work? Or are they just going and becoming an imam of a masjid or somewhere else doing an interpreter role or something else? Where is the da'wah? Where is the calling people to Islam? Where is the amana and the trust that you have been given with this knowledge to call people to Allah's path? Why are not more people calling their people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why is this world lacking? people to call people to Islam. Ya khuti, we must do our jobs. And that is why if we do our jobs, the punishment will co not come upon us. It will come upon the people who did not believe in us. But if we do not do our jobs, we will be the first of the people to be destroyed. As we know in that authentic narration in Bukhari, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Jibreel to go and destroy a, a, a city. So Jibreel came back and said, Ya Allah, there are people that worship you in that city. So Allah said, start with them. Start with them. 
Fa'ya ikhwati, we must do our jobs, otherwise we will also be drowned. We will also be drowned and we will also be destroyed. We must be the first of the people. Do you know the scholars of Islam state that the first of the people to be judged on the day of judgment will be the Muslimin. Amongst them, the first of the people to be judged amongst the Muslimin will be the Duat and the scholars of Islam. Why? So that if they did their job, they will be rewarded. If they didn't do their job, so that Allah makes an example of them before all of humanity. So my brothers and sisters of Islam, now that you know, you must call people to the path of Allah. You must every day, Layla wa Nahara, Jiharan wa Asrara. You must call people to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then finally, Nuh, Nuh alayhi salatu salam finishes off and he says, and look at the etiquette of making dua. He says, Rabbi ghfir li, O Allah forgive me. Not how people say today first, may Allah forgive you and me. No, no, no. Sunnah is to first make dua for yourself. Okay? And what does Allah say in the last few verses of Surah, uh, Surah Baqarah? Rabbana ghufir lana wali ikhwanina alladheena sabaquna bil iman. So the etiquette of making dua is for yourself first, then those next, then those next. Does that make sense? So first yourself. Rabbi ghufir li wali walidayya wali man dakhala baytiya mu'mina wali al-mu'minina wal mu'minat. Yani the next and the next in, in terms of his right upon them. So first forgive me, then my parents who have the most right upon me, and then my guests who have the most right upon me. And then of course, my believing brothers and sisters who have the most right upon me. Can you see how he has made dua? So Yehwati, this is how you should make dua. First for yourself and then the most closest and closest to. And then, and then after that. Rabbi ghafir li wali walidayya. Also remember to make dua for your parents. So Nuh make dua for his parents. So should you Yehwati, make dua for your parents. It's very, very critical. Very critical because Allah will accept your dua for your parents and their dua for you. So make dua for them. Rabbi ghfir li wali walidayya wali man dakhala bayti and whoever has entered my house. Minal mu'mina walil mu'minina wal mu'minat. Whoever has entered my house as a believer. Meaning that you should not let anyone enter your house except a good believer. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, let not anyone eat your food except the righteous people. Meaning you should befriend righteous people. You should look after righteous people. Your guests should be righteous people. Those are the people that should be around you. And the righteous uh, believing men and righteous believing women. And do not increase the zalimeen, the wrongdoers, except in misguidance and arrogance and destruction in this dunya. This is Surah Nuh. Alhamdulillah, beautiful Surah. <coughs> and Alhamdulillah, uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you all with the remembrance of this beautiful surah and, and the relevance that it has to your life. I'm just going to recite in Arabic, inshallah, now that you know the meaning of it. And for those who know it in Arabic, uh, of course, alhamdulillah, for those who don't know, most of you don't know uh, the Arabic language. So I'm going to, now that you know the meaning of it, let me recite in Arabic and see, mashallah, whether the meaning of the Arabic now has an impression on your hearts now, inshallah ta'ala. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inna arsalna Nuhan ila qawmihi an anzir an anzir qawmaka min qabli an yatiyahum adabun alim qala ya qawmi inni lakum nadhirun mubin an i'budu allah wa attaquhu wa ati'un يغفر لكم من ذنوبكم ويؤخركم إلى أجل مسمى إن أجل الله إذا جاء لا يؤخر لو كنتم تعلمون قال رب إني دعوت قومي ليلا ونهارا فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعَوْتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْا ثِيَابَهُمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْا ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُّوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا 
ثم إني دعوتهم جهارا ثم إني أعلنت لهم وأسررت لهم إسرارا فقلت استغفروا ربكم إنه كان غفارا يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا ويمددكم بأموال وبنين ويجعل لكم جنات ويجعل لكم جنات ويجعل لكم أنهارا ما لكم لا ترجون لله وقارا وقد خلقكم أطوارا ألم تروا كيف خلق الله سبع سماوات طباقا وجعل القمر فيهن نورا وجعل الشمس سراجا والله أنبتكم من الأرض نباتا ثم يعيدكم فيها ويخرجكم إخراجا والله جعل لكم الأرض بساطا لتسلكوا منها سبلا فجاجا قال نوح رب إنهم عصوني واتبعوا من لم يزده ماله وولده وولده إلا خسارا ومكروا مكرا كبارا وقالوا لا تذرن آلهتكم ولا تذرن ودا ولا تذرن ودا ولا سواعا ولا يغوث ويعوق ونصرا وقد أضلوا كثيرا ولا تزد الظالمين إلا ضلالا مما خطيئاتهم أغرقوا وأدخلوا نارا فلم يجدوا لهم من دون الله أنصارا وقال نوح رب لا تذر على الأرض من الكافرين ديارا إنك إن تذرهم يضلوا عبادك ولا يلدوا ولا ولا يلدوا إلا فاجرا كفارا رب اغفر لي ولوالدي ولمن دخل بيتي ولمن دخل بيتي مؤمنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات ولا تزد الظالمين إلا تبارا زقم الخير أسك الله سبحانه وتعالى تبني في رأس نيو with this إن شاء الله يا أخوتي tomorrow بإذن الله السورة Jinn, inshallah ta'ala, we will talk all about the unseen world around us. <laughs> they are all around us and listening uh, and hearing everything we're saying. Inshallah, we'll learn about them in great detail. Uh, inshallah, uh, so please don't miss it. Surah Jinn, 5.15 p.m. sharp tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.